all the time, always to sing, but to sing the name of Jesus. And, uh, really, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Thank you for making us whole. And we get together on Sundays because it's the first day of the week. You know, we say oftentimes every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday. And so we celebrate the resurrection of Christ every Sunday. And so very, very thankful for this particular and, and special Sunday. And uh, music is beautiful and music, uh, I mean, uh, musicians, everything. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for making this weekend work throughout our family conference this year. Everyone has been working behind the scenes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for working so hard to eat the donuts this morning. That was, I know that's, that's important, you know, being a good steward, making sure that you take care of eating all the manna that's up there, and uh, I'm so very thankful. I'm not so sure it tasted like that back then, but I'm thankful, again, for everyone that's done all that they have done from the coffee house to the the technical team crew upstairs and behind the scenes, the sound, everything that we did in the fellowship hall. Friday night was a great night. We were able to uh, have relationships uh, from stem to stern, talking about how to do relationships well, especially if those that are not married and are considering being married and are single and one day maybe wanting to know how to court, date, and do well. Of course, it centers up on Jesus and uh, when has it ever been convenient or easy to love anyone? It takes sacrifice, and we learned that out of 1 John 4. And then, of course, last night we had uh, our married couples come last night, and what a great time. We had a wonderful turnout both evenings and a wonderful meal of food and a great meal, spiritually speaking, and so very, very thankful. And this morning, once again, we're going to get into the Word of God. We asked Pastor Kevin Pesky to come from First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester. It's a big sacrifice. He is the lead pastor of a church of like 20,000, 25,000 people. Yeah. 30. You're up to 30 now Last from the time that you left to, to by faith. Oh, gosh. But uh, a wonderful church that's been a ministering partner and really a, a good dad to us and a big brother in so many ways. Very, very thankful for them. Of course, we had Pastor George Grace in the fall. Uh, he did okay, you know, he was, he was, he did pretty good, uh, no, and our theme for our Acts 1-8 conference, what a tremendous conference we had in Christ alone, and so we continue our family conference after many things going on in our ministry, this has been a good time to just rest, be still, and listen for God, and Pastor Kevin Pesky, a God man, he is uh, a tremendous example to me, a model of walking and living for the Lord, a shepherd of shepherds, a servant who desires to sacrifice. He brought his wife, Savannah, but uh, he said, you are not allowed to be here. Oh, there you are. You're there. Savannah, please stand up so we can recognize you and greet you and say thank you uh, so very much. I looked around. I'm sorry. I, you know, the eyes are going. The senses, they're falling apart. But I'm glad that you're here to hear your husband a second time. Does he get better the second time? <laughs> we'll find out. But it is so so wonderful for our church. What a great investment that uh, God's men have made in this church over 26 years. Just to be reminded, this is our 26th year anniversary. By the way, this past Thursday, the 4th of May, was the 26th year that this church was launched out and commissioned. Of course, last year we had our 25th anniversary. We were out in the parking lot last year with a big old tent and all kinds of festivities, and I think we had the same kind of food. No, we didn't. We went a little bit further than that, but this is a celebration weekend for us as well, and again, please greet Pastor Kevin Pesky. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's awesome. You're the best. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Bible Baptist Church. It's good to be a part of uh, just singing praise this morning. I... Uh, Appreciate the praise team and the effort that they put into it, the musicians and uh, all the technicians and the work that is done. Uh, so thank you if you're in here. I appreciate that. Uh, the name of Jesus is worth the efforts. 
And I just love, that as we think about the, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world, that we might have redemption and forgiveness of our sin. I mean, Sunday morning, can you imagine right now the churches, not just here in Kansas City, but the world that are lifting their hands and praising the name of Jesus Christ that is coming up to the throne room of God. And that's exciting right there. I hope you're excited. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I appreciate what uh, Mark said about me. Most of it was not true, but uh, thank you for, for saying that. I have to be careful what I say as well today. My wife is here, so I can't lie about my family and tell stories like that. But uh, we're going to try to have a good time anyways. 1 John chapter 4, why don't you open up your Bible? I hope that you do have a Bible. If you don't, there are probably digital versions that you can grab. You're going to want your Bible. You're going to need your Bible, not just for Sunday morning, but for life in every way. Let me pray and we'll get started here this morning. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your love towards us. Even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Now you've made a way for us to enter boldly into the throne room of grace. We can come before you, God, without an animal, without a priest, but because of the high priest. Thank you, Jesus. God, I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to work in each of our lives. I pray that you would illuminate the word truth would come off the pages of your book, and it would land as a seed into the good soil of our hearts. God, it's only you that can do these works. We need you this morning, the few moments that we have. I pray it would be a meal, a spiritual meal that would satisfy us and sustain us to do the, the spiritual, the supernatural, the divine that you have called your people to. So, Lord, I just ask humbly for your will to be accomplished in the few moments that we have here this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First John chapter 4 is where we will be. I'll get there in just a minute. You might remember in 2003, Hurricane Isabel slammed into the east coast of the United States. It left millions of people without electricity, and I think there was 16, 17 people that actually died because of that hurricane. The edge of that hurricane passed through parts of Washington, D.C., uh, uh, prompting the President of the United States and the Congress to find safer quarters. They actually left that area. But that was not the case at the Arlington National Cemetery, where guards at the tomb of the unknown soldier stood as they had stood every day and every hour of that day since July 1st. 1937, 24 hours a day, every single day, every single week, every single month. When the hurricane hit, the soldiers remained at their post, even though they were given permission by the President of the United States to essentially abandon their post. That's what a soldier does. He acknowledges the storm, but he doesn't give in to it. He stands firm. As a friend told me, if these men can stand guard over the dead, how much more important is it that I stand guard over the living? My wife, my children. Like these soldiers, we are called to stand and to do our duty while staring down the very storms that seek to rob us of courage and taunting and tempting us to neglect our duty and abandon our posts. And of course, there's even going to be well-credentialed people that tell us and encourage us to abandon our duty in all of this. Well, as a parent, there are storms that rise up. It's difficult to parent. It is hard to parent, but we must not leave our post. God has called us to parent, to train, to guide, to show the love of the Father to these little human beings. I love talking to first-time parents or expectant parents. They're so full of bliss. They're so excited that the newborn is coming their way. 
they haven't experienced the sleepless nights yet. They haven't, uh, 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 you know, got the child ready for church in the perfect outfit. The hair is in those little, you know, rubber band thingies, and uh, outfit is perfectly matched with mom's. And as they're about to walk out the door, the back end of that child blows out. They haven't experienced that yet, right? They they don't understand what takes place. Uh, They don't get later on the social pressures, the bullying, right, the teenage years. And and I just look and say, children are a gift from God. God bless you. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16 says this, And we know, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. John chapter 13 kind of coincides in my mind with a parallel thought. Jesus speaking in verse 33 and verse 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If, caveat, ye have love one for another. See, it's not simply receiving, it's actually giving out. It's showing forth the love of God that we are expected to do. I want to use our time this morning, obviously, to get into the Scripture. The most important thing that you hear will not be my voice, it'll be God's voice. That's what's necessary. And, and what we want to hear is God's voice concerning the raising, the training, and the parenting of children here this morning. I, I was looking over some things that I recently used, and if you were to look around, you would probably see the same things. While my wife was here uh, with me, we did a little bit of shopping, and so in our hotel room, there's a couple tags, and on those tags, it tells you where the, you know, well, the name of the store, who manufactured it, and, and so as you look at things, you know, uh, uh, if, if you were to look at this uh, coat, you would say that it's made in, uh, in Italy, Right? If you were to look at the pants that I'm wearing, they would say made in England. If you were to look at the shoes that I'm wearing, they'd say they're made in China. Okay? If you were to look at the car that I drove, I think it was manufactured in the United States of America. Right? Well, the reality is, if you could, if you could look at the back of your child, and if there was a tag on the back of your child, every child would say, made in the image of God. Every single child. I mean, we're not just talking Christian children. We're not talking American children. We're not talking conservative children. We're talking every single child, whether born a few ounces or born 14 or 15 pounds, whether born African or Asian or European or Latino, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're born from uh, uh, you know, a, a family of great wealth or a family that has almost nothing. Every single child born in the image of God. Now, I want to do make a a distinction that I think is important for us. We can say that everybody is born in the image of God, but not everybody is the child of God. You become a child of God when you are adopted into the family. When by faith you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you then become a child of God. But make no difference, every single person that you look at as you walk down the streets of Kansas City or through the colleges uh, and the campuses or, or in your workplace, every single person you see has a stamp on them by the manufacturer that says, made in the image of God. The problem is the image of God is tarnished in our lives from conception. We have a sin nature, born in Adam's sin. We not only have sin, our DNA is broken, Right? We willfully choose to sin. And that sin doesn't just disappear when we mature and when we grow up, if you will. It can only be divinely removed. That DNA, that sin nature that we have, it's really the work of God Himself that must be accomplished in our life, in the life of our children. The government and its schools and education cannot change our children. Are you hearing me this morning? Uh, uh, our income and the wealth that we accumulate is not going to spiritually and divinely and supernatural change the DNA of your children. The church itself cannot change your children. Uh, do you understand me? 
It's really the work of Jesus Christ himself that can change your child. That's the only hope we have. But God has created a system that is intended to help direct us and maximize the image of God for us and for our children. It is a system that is designed so that every child would genuinely know God and God's great love for all people through the gospel. And that system, I believe, is called the family. Lindsay Bell said this, the goal of parenting isn't to create perfect kids. It's to point our kids to the perfect God. What determines my child's potential is their response to God and what he says in the word. And the key to unlocking God's potential for our children greatly depends on parenting, okay? One man said this, children are God's gift to immature people. I like that. Children are the greatest legacy we'll have, either positive or negative. Children will also be the greatest challenge in life. It's hard work. It's not for the faint of heart. It takes work. Before you're a parent, you think of all the wonder. You think of all the excitement. You only see the positive. You, you watch these parents pushing their children through the mall, and you see these matching and cute little outfits and dropping them off in the nursery with their adorable little cute things, right? What you don't see is the sleepless nights, the, the sickness and the vomit and, the, and all that else that comes out of the, the bodies of these children and these stupid car seats that you have to have an engineering degree to figure out how to connect together. Right? I mean, nobody talks to you about this. Then try to teach a child to tie their shoe, right? It doesn't work. Put the seat down after they've gone to the bathroom. Or the joy of trading in your fun car for a minivan. They're not like little Amazon packages that when you get, you go, oh, I don't really like this. I think I'm just going to return it now and upgrade or whatever it might be. 3 John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And if you're here today and you have children and the heart of the Father is in you, I know that verse resonates with you. You want your children to walk in truth. David Platt said this, our goal in parenting is not ultimately for our kids to get a great education or to be great athletes or to find a great husband or to get a great career. Our goal is for them to love a great God. But to have a child that walks with the Lord in truth, it doesn't just happen. It's not magic. It's not chance. It is effort and commitments. Some parents say, oh, you don't know my kid. Oh, you don't understand what they, uh, my child does this, my child does that. No, no. It's God that's called us to parent, and he has sovereignly, as the king eternal immortal, given you those little terrorists, okay, for you to train up. And it's going to be a challenge. If you don't believe me, spend the afternoon with a two-year-old that didn't get their nap. Spend time with a 15-year-old girl that just broke up with her boyfriend. There are going to be challenges in life. And the art of parenting is incredibly challenges. There are highs, there are lows, there are mountaintop experiences. I remember bringing my little girl home for the very first time figuring out how to get her in that car seat, driving home from the hospital as we're going down the road and thinking to myself, looking all around and going, it's a dangerous place. I need to protect this child. We're never going to leave the house, right? Dead bolted, shotgun at the door. We, are, we need to be safe, right? First birthday, that cake as the child grabs that thing and shoves it in the mouth, right? Watching all that stuff. Their first Christmas Watching them get on the school bus for the first time and thinking to yourself, what do we just do? Kids go off to school without you. Seeing them learn of God. The light bulb beginning to pop in their head. And them wanting to talk to you about forgiveness, sin, and the love that Jesus has for them. It's beautiful. It's great watching them learn how to walk learn how to talk. Then there's valleys, watching them learn how to walk and talk. <laughs> and they struggle in social circles. I don't know why, but I have my oldest daughter. She likes to wait until 9 or 9.30 at night to say, Dad, I need help with my homework. 
I need help with the Spirit of God right now, okay? <laughs> it's the finding the right balance of boundaries and technology. It's puberty. It's pimples. And, and I'm a girl dad and proud of it. But there's times that I walk into the, in, into the bathroom and you pull yards of hair out. And you think, what is happening in this house, right? God calls us to be stewards. As Hannah reminds us in 1 Samuel, these little people are just lent to us from God. Although they've come from the womb of their mother, they are, we are just stewarding, stewarding them. Now the Old Testament's filled, and I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4 through 9, we'll go there. It, the Bible gives us a great understanding of the role of the father and the mother, the family, and what the home is. And as we look into this principle, you're going to see that within Judaism, there was this this amazing idea and concept that we are to be the ones that influence our children. They were to teach them the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the principles, the precepts of Moses and the laws and all these things, that they would know, they would know the love of God and desire to follow the ways of God because of the influence of their own parents. Deuteronomy 6, have you found it? Verse 4 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice what he says there. He's saying, hey, you don't just fill them with data. It's not just information, right? It's not just Jesus died on a cross. Jesus rode again three days from the, from the dead. Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. Not just data, not just information, not just knowledge, but it impacts our heart because Jesus came, died, rose again, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. It should transform my heart and change everything. Verse 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. As I read this, I think to myself, full saturation. That's what Moses is describing here. What does he want us to do? Fully and completely saturate our children with the knowledge, the understanding of who God is. It was a parental responsibility to teach and train children about God. Many parents somehow want to just expose their children to God and then let them make their own decisions about this, right? That's ridiculous. Uh, I have a, a childhood friend. Uh, at the time, they lived across the street from my parents. And um, the, my, 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 my buddies, they, their dad was a police officer. And at this time in, in our world, police officers, they were rugged, they were tough, they were macho men. And this man was the epitome of this. He was barrel-chested, big shoulders, and frankly, a jerk, okay? And my best friends, they were all strong football players, they were tough. And uh, the dad, he was one of these police officers that he ate, uh, he drank, he lived this stuff. He talked about the lieutenants, the sergeants, the captains. He talked about what happened that night. He talked about what happened during the day. What's going on in the world? And when he would rise up, he would tell his kids. When, he would, when they would go uh, throughout the day, he was telling them what to look out for and what he would see as a police officer. He was fully saturating them with law enforcement. Not even intentionally, not even that he was trying to make them police officers, but it was just what was in his heart was coming out. Now, the reality is these three boys, they didn't get along with their dad. He was a jerk. We could often hear them get in arguments, often hear the door slam, often hear the car pull out and the tires squeal down the road. The father and those three boys didn't have a great relationship. You know what happened? Later on when those boys grew up, they all got into law enforcement. Not because their daddy was a good guy, but because their daddy saturated them with law enforcement, and it just filled their heart and made them who they became. I was talking with a, a little 10-year-old girl. She's my daughter's best friend, and she told me that uh, she wants to own a salon someday when she grows up. And uh, I said, oh, tell me why. Well, 
You know why? Her mommy owns a salon. And so because her mommy owns a salon and her mom makes these other women beautiful and does their hair and their nails and pedicures, all these different things, this girl thinks to herself, there can be no greater thing to do with my life than to make other women beautiful. Because her mom talks about this. Her mom lives this. Her mom studies this. Her mom has always experienced bringing her into the salon, showing her how to do this, talking about everything that takes place. I know a family in our church, unfortunately, that supports the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they have for generations. Every Sunday during football season, the, the granddad would watch the game and he'd cheer on the team. He would yell at the screen, at the, at the, at the TV, he would take one of the, the terrible towels and, and wave that thing around, and he would dance in the living room when the game would go well, and, and he would curse in the garage when it didn't go well, right? Nobody quite remembers when they became a Steelers fan. All they know is they've been Steelers fans for as long as they can know. They talk about the history, the family time together around the football, they can recount the big wins, the crushing defeats, all of that cements them together as a Steeler family. And someday there'll be a fourth generation. And that granddaddy, he's going he's to buy that onesie that with a big Steeler on it. And, give, and then later that kid's going to grow up and he's going to get a little Steeler hoodie, right? And when he gets the, his first car, he's gonna, dad's gonna, granddad's going to sneak out there and slap a, a Steeler sticker on the bumper stick on the bumper. To, so everybody knows that he's a Steeler fan teaches them about the Steelers. He talks to them, walks with them. When they go out, when he rises up, when they sit down, it's Steelers, Steelers, Steelers. It would be ridiculous for that dad to tell his son, you know what, let's do this. I'm going to talk about the other 31 teams, the pros, the cons, and what I want you to do is I want you to make your own choice. I don't know, that's not how Steeler families work. Can you imagine being a Steeler dad and saying, well, the better team is the Kansas City Chiefs, so why don't you jump on that bandwagon right now, right? I mean, that would be evil <laughs> and wrong to do such things. The principle from Deuteronomy 6 is a principle that works in everything in life. It's the same thread. Our children are to learn from us parents about God. They should hear us talk about God. They should hear us praying to the Lord. They should see us doing things that are pleasing. By the way, things that are pleasing is called faith. We get faith from the Scripture. If you want to know how to please God, open up your Bible and you will see. We need to be changed by the presence of the Lord. Our kids need to see us sacrificing for the Lord, reading, telling others. When our children see us modeling these things, they will want to do the same and model it as well. Deuteronomy 6 talks about our heart. What is in our heart is what our children will grab hold of. Taught. Who is God? What does he expect? We sit down. We go over relationships, boundaries, expectations. We walk with them, whether it's in the community or it's about education or it's about career choice. It's about who we date and all these different things. When we, we, we should talk when they go to bed, when they, when they rise up. This is not about your child being dropped off at Sunday school for 60 minutes and you walking away saying, I did my job. I've given every opportunity for my kid to know the Lord. Wrong. It's not, it's not me signing up my kid to take him to youth camp this summer. And for five days or six days, they're at youth camp. And by the way, I'm for Sunday school and I'm for youth camp. But it's not the primary ex responsibility of those things. It is your responsibility, my responsibility as parents to pour in, to saturate, to invest in my children. It's about what is in our heart coming out and leaking into their heart. It's the leaky heart that our children need from us, that the things of God would leak, would spill into every aspect of their life. Whether we're playing a game or doing homework with our kids, whether we're eating out or taking a vacation, whether we have a, 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 a big house and lots of money or a small apartment, we're living paycheck to paycheck. The love of God, the goodness of God, the hope of the resurrection should leak, should spill out of our heart into everything and of our lives. The greatest influence our children and our grandchildren will have is parents. 
what you are passionate about is what they will be passionate about. Now listen, according to both secular and sacred research, the greatest influencer in the lives of children is parents. Parents. It's almost like the Bible knows what it's talking about here. Now parenting has taken a, a free fall in the last few decades. It went from something that was considered a primary responsibility and an honor to something that has become an addendum to the life of many husbands and wives. It's now something we try to squeeze in if we have time between drips to the gym, outings with friends, vacation, extra sports, work, my time on social media, movies, all the other things that we add to our life, well, I'll add parenting to that list as well. Listen, if we don't put together a strong foundation for the life of our children, they are quite literally destined for troubled waters. To parent well is by, by far the most important achievement that we can attain. Of course, just about the time you start to get good at it, the little boogers change. You get good at those two, three-year-olds, you start to get the rhythm of life, and they move on to a new era, right? And you start to get good at that, and you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to start to figure this out, and then you, they become teenagers, and you just throw the book out the window and pray that it ends soon, right? Listen, parents, you should be leaning into the Lord. You should be studying the Scripture. You should be crying out to God. You should be asking the Spirit of God to lead, guide, and direct you. You should be listening. I mean, we live in a world where you can listen to family podcasts, parenting podcasts, how to raise children. There are books. There are things that you can study for you just to say, well, I don't know what I'm doing. This is a terrible thing for you to do. Your kids deserve your very, very best. We make the mistake of thinking our children are more influenced by TV, radio, music, friends, or people on the bus than by you. But that is not true. The biggest influence in the life of your children is you. Now, there is a secret game that they do play. I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious. They don't always uh, 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 want us to know how much they need us, so they play this game. Now, when my daughters were real little, they would reach up and grab my hand. And we would just walk through the mall. We'd walk through church. We'd walk through the neighborhood just holding the hands, having a good time, right? And then later, you know, as the year goes by, it would be me that would reach down and grab hands, and we'd walk through the mall, walk through the church, walk through the neighborhood. And, and now I've realized, as they've gotten older, I'm reaching, but there's nobody's hand that's there anymore, right? They, they don't want that anymore for me. And, and there's times I drop my kids off at school, and I, you know, as a dad, you're supposed to embarrass your kids, right? So I make sure that there's some other kids around, the window goes down, and say, I love you guys. I love you guys. Can you hear me? Dad, I heard you. I love you too. Okay, just want to make sure, right? <laughs> publicly, they're embarrassed of, of me, and that's one of the roles as a parent is to publicly embarrass your children. When my daughter comes home at night and we get on the couch, I'll sit down, the other girl's already in bed. She'll come up, the whole couch is empty, just me on the edge. She'll come up and sit right next to me. And I'll be honest with you, at the end of the night, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want anybody next to me right now. I just want to be left alone. But this teenage girl comes up, sits right next to me, puts her head on my shoulder, invades my privacy, puts her legs up on my legs, and just wants to talk to her daddy. Because parents, there's times when your kids are going to walk away and they're going to act like they don't need you anymore. Lean in. Cross those lines. You are the biggest and greatest influence in their lives. They need you. It can feel like our kids push away. and Maybe it's part of it's our fault. We get distracted. We get busy. Maybe it's part natural growth. Maybe it's common. It's actually a child's way of sometimes testing us to see if we love and care enough for them, we are to cross those lines and remind them that we love them unconditionally. Turn in Ephesians chapter 6, back in the New Testament. We saw in the Old Testament, and I want you to see this principle in the New Testament. 
I'm sure if you've been around the church for any length of time, you probably have read through these texts. But it's a family conference, and so a reminder for us of these great principles. Ephesians chapter 6, right before the book of Philippians, in verse 1, Paul writes this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it might be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Most people stop there, right? (laughs) But verse 4 is what I want to camp on here. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That means you don't need to be a jerk to your children. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To nurture means that we are the ones that promote growth and education. There is learning that should take place. We must instruct our children on who God is. It must be legitimate. It must be sufficient. Say, well, I'm not sure I know that much. Get involved in church. Get involved in discipleship. Don't make excuses and say, I I just don't know. Get in. This is your child's future and eternity at stake. Dive in. Grab hold of the feet of Jesus and say, I need you, God, through all this. Now, my oldest, she's in the seventh grade. Uh, She's been in school for seven years. And uh, the very first year, they began to teach her math. You know why? Because she was born not knowing math. And so they began at the very beginning, one plus one is two. And after they got done with one plus one and they got to two plus two, they didn't stop. In second grade, they taught her more concepts. Third grade, more concepts. I mean, she's in the, I mean, how much math does a person need, right? She's got five more left, five more years And I'm at the point now where she's, Dad, Dad, can you help me with math? And I pull out my friend, Mr. Google. You betcha I can help with this. I mean, what in the world? How much math does a person? And sometimes we as parents think, how much God does a, how how much God does my child need? I sent him to Sunday school, and they learned those lessons. They know David took down Goliath. I mean, they know Jesus died on the cross. What else is there to know? Listen, if a child needs 12 years of math, How much do they need of God? A child doesn't just have an understanding. We must nurture that understanding. Giving them their own Bible is good, but reading it with them, talking through it, applying it to their life. How do we love our neighbors? What does that look like? What about when it comes to social justice? What does the Bible have to say? What about when it comes to uh, transgender issues, non-binary thoughts that are going to be Uh, thrown at them at a very young age in public schools and definitely in universities. We must prepare our children to have right understanding in all of this. What about other religion? How do we respect people that we don't agree with? How do we forgive? How do we deal with marriage challenges? What about death? Teach, apply, instruct, reinforce. Math one. Math 2, Math 3, Math 4. Over and over and over again, we are told to nurture our children. Secondly, we are told to admonish them. Admonish means we are to warn. We are to counsel against. The word admonish means we are to scold. It means we are to enforce obligations. Parenting is different than friendship. You can become friends later. Your kids have friends. You don't need to be one of their friends. They need a mother. They especially need a father. Once they're grown, I hope that you have great relationships with them. If a child is is nurtured and admonished correctly, the child is going to respect their parents, and later in life they'll have that great relationships. There are hard things that we as parents must do. We must keep our children from doing that which will cause them harm or hurt to themselves and others. We must discipline them to help them realize there are boundaries in this life and there are consequences to wrong actions and behavior in this life. Are you following me? Listen, we look at our world right now and we see people have lost their mind. They've gone crazy. And the reality is 
they were crazy as children and nobody controlled them and now they're out of control as adults. We must teach our, our, teach our children responsibility and obligation. I didn't put this verse on the screen, but I want you to listen to me carefully. In Proverbs 13, in verse 24, he says this. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Discipline is one of those subjects that nobody talks about anymore. I, I, I mean, there's all sorts of studies and books and, 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 and things out there to say that we shouldn't correct our children, we shouldn't discipline, we shouldn't, spend, we shouldn't do any of these things. It's going to hurt their little fragile psyches and they're going to grow up to be broken people. You know what the Bible says? He that spareth the rod hates his son. It goes on to say, he that loveth him chastens him. Do you really love your child? You need to pull out the rod. Proverbs 19 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Okay? It, listen, children aren't going to say to you, Hey, Mom, um, I just did something that's wrong. Here's the rod. Would you take care of that for me? No, no. What they are going to do is, uh, what I do is I say to my children, when they've done something wrong, I say, I want you to go to my bedroom. Okay? If it's not a major issue and we're just going to have a talk, it's go to your bedroom. I'll be up in a minute. If it's spank time, it's my bedroom. And they immediately, Dad, what happened? What's going on? What happened? Uh, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't know what I, 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 and excuses start to come. They get into the bedroom. They sit there. I show up a couple minutes later and I, uh, I, I, and I say, okay, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to discipline you. Tears, begging, crying. You know what the Bible says in this text? He says, let not thy soul spare for his crying. They are going to cry. And he says, chasten thy son while there is hope, meaning start young and continue doing it. Verse 22, or chapter 22 of Proverbs says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Do you hear what he just said there? When you hit the hiney, Evil comes out of the heart. That's what God expects us to do, is to, is to s discipline that. Now listen, I'm going to talk and beat. And I know there's people in here that have said, my daddy didn't do it right, my mama didn't do it right, they, I've been abused, I've been hurt, I would never do that to a child. It's not right to do that. Listen, the Bible calls us to do this. And there are right ways to correct our children. Never with anger is it the right way to do it. Never do you go into your child and say, I told you to do this and you didn't do this. I'm so mad and angry. No. What they did is they disobeyed God. And now you are simply correcting their wrong behavior. And when you do that, their heart is changed. And it's beautiful. My wife and all, we, you know, we didn't want to, you don't want to hit your, you don't want to, you don't want to discipline your child. But man, every time we've ever disciplined our child, after we're done crying together and praying together, that child walks out of the bedroom with their heart full and they have joy and they've been loved by a person that cares about them enough to correct their behavior in all of these things. There's a concept in Titus chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 that older women are to teach younger women how to train their children, how to rule their house, all of these things. Men are to invest in other men. You say, I don't know how to discipline. I, you know, this wasn't done in my home. I've just become a Christian. I don't know what these verses mean. That's fine. Go to an older woman and say, how did you do it? Go to an older man and say, what did this look like in your life? Don't just look at these verses and say, I can't do that. And allow your child to continue in their brokenness without the help that is needed. Our country is facing a crisis. It's, it's not a political crisis. It's a parenting crisis. The biggest crisis our, our country faces is a need for genuine parents, moms, and especially dads that will train up their children, nurturing, 
and admonishing them. Here's some statistics. One in four children in America live without a dad, whether biological, stepped, or adoptive. Four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager, more likely to face abuse, neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to go to prison, two times more likely to suffer from obesity, two times more likely to drop out of high school, more likely to commit crime. But some of this is skewed. Just because there's a male in the house doesn't mean there's actually a father in the house. As the proverb tells us, it takes training for a child to go down the correct path by nature. A child will choose to do that which is wrong. We don't need to teach a child how to whine or, or complain. My wife and I were foster parents, and we recently had these, uh, this three-year-old and five-year-old, um, these girls in our home, and we had a great weekend. These girls were fantastic. They fit really well into our home, but at some point, you know, kids are kids, and this little five-year-old said, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to stomp my feet. And I said, well, go ahead. I mean, there, you know, there's no manual on feet stomping. Did you know that? It's, it's not like you, as a parent, you say, okay, the first thing you do when you want to stomp correctly, left foot always goes first. Left foot followed by a hard right, okay? And then you want to get down in your stance, repeat, left, hard right. If you can get down low enough, eventually you're going to want to hit your hands and really go in, and that will get you the result. There's no manual on this thing. Who taught the kid to stomp their feet? It's in there. It's in there. You know what parents' job is to do? It's to correct. It's to love. And I get it, single parents that are out here, the job is going to be more difficult, but God has given us the church to help this godly family of people, this host of holy, holy grandparents and, and, and Christian aunts and uncles that can come into your life. If you're a single parent in here, lean into the resources of this church. Go out to lunch. Take these people out to coffee. Figure out a way to allow them to invest in your life. Or just drop them off at Dwayne's house. He'll take care of them anyways. <laughs> to train up a child the way he should go, be intentional. Be consistent. Make God a priority. Make Bible reading and family time intentional. Make coming to church a priority. Make dinner time a priority. Turn off the gadgets, the, the devices, the technology, the, the Pandora or Spotify. Let it be all gone. Get off the couch. Come to a table. Make sure that that time, whatever it is, everybody knows it doesn't matter if there's sports, it doesn't matter if there's lessons, it doesn't matter where it is. At 5.30 or 6 o'clock, everybody is going to be in this house eating the meal together. Be a model. Let them look at your, your life and see. Be an encourager. Tell them, I love you. Show them you love them. Be involved in their life. Help them with their homework. Look at their assignments. Kick the ball. Teach them to hunt, play chess. Go to their recitals, how painful this is. Show them the correct way to replace the toilet paper. I mean, this needs to be done. <laughs> Define truth. Help them understand there are absolutes in this world that the President of the United States doesn't get to change. There are absolutes that even the church doesn't get to change. And that every one of us will stand accountable to God. Take spiritual risks. Show them how to care for the sick. Go visit a nursing home or go on a missions trip. Become a foster care family. Volunteer at church together. Give together. Sacrifice together. Open this and see what it says and then say, guys, we haven't been doing it right. We're going to make some changes in our house because of what the Bible says. Lastly, I want you to look in, back in the Old Testament, Psalm 127 kind of right in the middle of your Bible. If you let it flop open there, you'll find the book of Psalms. Find the big number 127. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. He says this. Love to hear the flipping of those pages. Psalm 127, verse 33 says, Lo, children are heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. These little children are a gift from God. Do you know the purpose of an arrow? The purpose of an arrow is that the man that holds it would put it in a bow and pull that bow back. 
and then it would release that arrow. And that arrow would go exactly where that man that's holding that bow aims it. I mean, to have a quiver full of arrows is nice, right? That's good. But nobody says, man, look at my quiver of arrows and, and, and then just puts them on display as a trophy. That's not what arrows are good for. They're not trophies. They're meant to be aimed out, to be shot out of the bow. They're meant to hit a target and to make a difference in this world. We're not to take our quiver and say, man, I got a full quiver. I got a lot of arrows. This is really, put it on the back of my little minivan, uh, raising arrows, right? All these little arrows there. Man, look at this quiver. This is good. No, no. The quiver is meant to be emptied at some point. We're to be filling these little children with the love of God, the understanding of God, the power of God. And then at some point, we draw back that bow. And we don't say to the arrow, oh, which way would you like to go? We don't look at the arrow and say, oh, you know, I, I think this would be good. You know, uh, wh what are your thoughts on this? We, the man, pulls that bow back and throws that arrow into the world. At some point, parents, it's our job to release our children into this world. It's a world of darkness. It's a world of perversion. It's a world of violence and murder. It's a world of hatred. There's terrible things that happen in this world, but the Bible says to us, take the arrow, pull it back on the bow, and when you release, allow it to go forth. There's a great example of this in the Bible. It says in John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he sent. You know what God the Father did? Reached down, pulled out his best arrow. He looked and saw this world living in darkness and evil. He looked and saw that there was none righteous, not even one in this world. And so the Father pulled out his bow, took this arrow, and launched his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. And that arrow hit its mark. Jesus lived in Jerusalem. He went through Samaria and Galilee and, 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 and made a difference in this world. He cast out demons. He fed the thousands with just a few fish and bread. He healed the lepers. He allowed people to uh, see. He walked on water. He had power and control and authority over everything. And yet at some point, they took that arrow and they nailed him to the cross. The father knew that when he sent his son into the world, it would be hard. And so he didn't just say, oh man, I'm just going to protect my arrow back here. You know, I know what they're going to do to Jesus eventually, and I don't want that for my son. God the father said, I want my son to make an impact. And now, of course, we know the story. <laughs> Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. On the third day he rose, now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was a pretty impactful uh, target right there, right? That arrow made some impact. I'm not sure that my, my children will make the same impact, but I know that God has created us as parents to invest in those children so that when we pull them back and we send them out into the world, they go forth with the love of the Father they go forth with the power of God, and no matter where they land, whether they're a plumber, a politician, an engineer, a stay-at-home mom, it doesn't matter what their title is. They've gone as an arrow to make a difference in this world. 1 John chapter 4, let me read the, te the text here. It says in verse 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected. God's love is that sacrificial. It's that perfect love. It's that continual, committed love. That's what we're doing as parents. We're filling our children with God's love. Not my human love, but God's love. And it's not love to protect them for their whole life. Dads, at some point, pull the bow back and aim your children in a direction that they should go. Moms, you can't coddle them the rest of their lives. 
can hug them and protect them. It's not love, it's narcissism. We at some point have to believe and trust God that He loves and that sovereign, that King eternal and mortal. That God has a plan for their life and He will use them. They are born in the image of God. They need your direction and God has put a calling on all of our lives whether grandparents or parents or single mothers or single dads, whoever you are here, God has called you to make an impact and to pull that bow back and launch it. The greatest influencer in your child's life, it's not Instagram. It's not dude perfect. It's not TikTok. It's not the NBA. It's not the NFL. And yes, those are influencers. Be careful what you allow your kids to watch. But mom or dad... I promise you, when you step in to the life of your child, there's something that God does that makes you the greatest influencer of their life. It makes you the one that has the greatest control of what they can be and what they can do. Just like those soldiers at the tomb of the unknown soul, when the storm came in, they did not abandon their post because it got difficult. The wind began to whip. The rain came down. They were soaked and saturated. And the President of the United States sent the message to them that said, hey, if you want to go home, you can. If you want to stop parenting, you can. We'll take over from here. No. You've got to be like a soldier. The tomb of the unknown. Say, I don't care what storm comes. I don't care what message comes. These are my children. And I will fight for my children. And I will train them, and I will love them, and I will care for them. I don't care what the world says. Eventually, I'm going to release them. No matter how hard and how wicked this world is, I'm going to pull that bow back. And not just a little dinky. I'm going to pull the bow back and release them to make an impact. Every one of us, God has called to make an impact in this world. That's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. The scripture has been clear today. I hope that God has spoken into your heart. That we wouldn't just be like, okay, I'm going to give them to Brownie on Sunday for 60 minutes. I'm going to send them to camp for five days and everything's going to be okay. They're going to be these wonderful arrows that go out in the world and do great things. No, it's you. It's me that God has called to be the greatest influencer in their lives. Let's pray together. Why don't you stand with me? Maybe you're here and you're thinking... I've not done a great job as a parent. Well, today would be a great day to turn that around. Today would be a great day for you to say, I want to be an example. I want to fully saturate my children. I want to uh, nurture and admonish, and eventually I want to release that arrow into the world. I'm going to pray, and maybe it's an opportunity for you to come and pray with me as well. Say, God, here I am. Husbands, take the hand of your wife and say, let's, let's get back to parenting. Maybe you're a single parent here and you say, I don't know how to do this alone. Maybe come over and see Brownie and he can find somebody to disciple you and walk with you through all of this. There are many times Pastor Kevin says to God, I don't know what I'm doing. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. It's okay to humble yourself before the Lord and need him to direct your steps in this world. I'm going to pray, then you can come and pray with me. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this, these words. I know that's challenging. I know it's hard. I know we've come from different backgrounds. We've had different people that have exampled for us, some good, some really bad. But God, I pray today that we would wipe the, the table clean and we would just walk in the path that you desire for us. And we would be the influence in our children's life that you've called us to. God, may your will be done. May your spirit be at work in hearts and minds and lives. So powerful. May your work be, God, that we would pivot from our current path and stand, walk that straight and narrow path that you have for each one of us. We love you, God. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.